The next two videos are just about games. There we go. We looked at the gaming spiritual successes that made publishers more embarrassed than someone replying to a waiter who says, enjoy your meal with you too. Oh no, can it even be possible? What's popping though? Uh, pretty good. Today we're chilling with some videos and then we're going to play some Monster Hunter World at the second half of the stream. Too often, publishers of letter game series they own the rights to dwindle or die, leaving it up to other developers, often the yeah, original yeah. creators of said games, to pick up the mantle. These homages have often been met with massive Kickstarter backings, huge sales, and even critical acclaim, proving to the publishers that maybe they should have actually done something with the stuff they own. And guess what? There are still I wish. I wish they would do this. <coughs> uh, what you're using in Monster Hunter World? Uh, charge plate? Yeah, Charge Blade. I'm using Charge Blade. There's more Come games on. making big publishers look silly, as you pointed out in the comments. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. without further ado, here are your suggestions for seven spiritual sequels that embarrassed big publishers. War. War never changes. And neither does EA's ability to totally sleep on a really good series <laughs> and screw over a game studio in the process. Yet another EA embarrassment was suggested by many commenters, including Mr. Michael, who wrote, What about Fallout, the spiritual successor to Wasteland? I bet EA were kicking themselves over that one. Wait, Back what? in 1988, <laughs> EA published Wasteland, a game set in post-apocalyptic America created by Interplay Productions. Okay. Years later, in 1997, Interplay Productions self-published Fallout, a post-nuclear role-playing game. Huh, that sure does look like their other game. I wonder why they didn't just call it Wasteland. Is it because EA? Yeah, it's because EA. Now, to be somewhat fair to EA, they didn't just abandon Wasteland after it came out. Their own internal development team did actually make a bizarre clown-filled sequel called Fountain of Dreams. Why though? Oh, that sounds... That, that, and by critic... <laughs> Music to my ears, my goodness! <laughs> At the time, EA eventually changed their minds years later, saying it wasn't a Wasteland sequel anymore. One reason we got this terrible non-sequel was because Interplay were trying to publish their own stuff, and EA got saltier than the Dead Sea. EA owned ah. the Wasteland franchise and wouldn't let it go, despite their own terrible attempt not even bothering to utilize the Wasteland name. That, that, that sounds about right with EA, to be honest. Hi, Melty! Welcome! How are you doing today? Interplay did attempt their own quasi-Wasteland sequel in 1989 called Meantime, but plans fell through and the game was cancelled. It wasn't until 1997 that Interplay took what they considered the best parts of Wasteland, put them into a new setting, and struck nuclear gold. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Good idea! All that futuristic satirical take on a nuclear apocalypse was a breath of fresh irradiated air for PC gamers ah, as yes. they explored the vast wasteland. Ah, see what they did there? Mm -hmm. Fallout's clever and often witty gameplay earned it great critical acclaim that it holds to this day, thanks to it spawning an entire frickin' franchise. I never saw this Interplay Fallout made a sequel, game. and when they fell into some financial trouble in the mid noughties Interplay licensed out the franchise rights to Bethesda Softworks, who later wrangled the entire series from them. Under Bethesda, Fallout went 3D and made the jump over to consoles, with multiple new installments, a slightly ropey MMO, and more recently, an extremely well-received TV show. Ain't much. Extremely well is a bit stretching. I would say well-received. I would say that it was well-received TV show. Stage clean up here, Vaulty. The only Fallout games I played were free, New Vegas and 76. I actually didn't play a single Fallout game, but I saw few of them being played. So I saw some of the games and I recognized them, but I did not play them myself. Eventually, presumably after feeling thoroughly stupid for picking a fight with Interplay, EA did sell the Wasteland rights to ex-Interplay dev and founder Brian Fargo in 2003. In nice. 2012, with the rise of crowdfunding, his new studio In Exile Entertainment successfully crowdfunded three times their requested nice. goal to make Wasteland 2 in 2014, then raised another $3 million for 2020's Wasteland My 3. My goodness! But Fallout wouldn't be the juggernaut it is today. You poor soul, you played 76? Lol. I heard that this game is... The 76 is pretty buggy. Like, it's not a bad game, but it has a lot and lot of lot of bugs in it. If EA hadn't clung onto the Wasteland rights and done nothing with them for over a decade. 
So Maybe. Thanks, EA. Wow, that feels weird to say. <laughs> it's funny, bad. I see. I'm surprised the Stardew Valley is here. Are you sure it's something? Yeah, I can imagine. It's a special kind of Most bed. Most spiritual successes tend to happen because the rights to some game series are held hostage by a stubborn publisher, so the original creators have mm. to go off and remake it under a different name. But some spiritual successes come out while the games are still being made and just mm. blow them out of the water. Mm. One such game was suggested by many of you, including Clouds and Days, who said, I always think of Stardew Valley and Harvest Moon slash Story of Seasons. Mm. Way back when, if you wanted to play a nice farming sim, Harvest Moon was your go-to. Mm. With the first title released on the SNES in 1996, it quickly set the bar for farm sims. Gained a... Will I play the fourth one? Mmm. Yay. But it is nice and full now to enjoy a chill pre-vacation stream. Yay, let's go! strong fan base and regularly released multiple new games for various this, Nintendo and Sony platforms. This uh, game series is still going strong. I see it popping up here and there constantly. Like I think it had a new installment on Nintendo Switch not long ago. Forms. But it didn't quite scratch the itch of all its fans. For example, when Eric Barone, aka Concerned Ape, graduated from university in 2011, he felt the Harvest Moon games were in a bit of a lull, so he decided to make his own version. Also, he had just graduated into a rec Although I'm not gonna share what I ate. Mm. Tori, I always wanna know what people eat. My own sister played Harvest Moon, nice! ...session with a computer science degree that he needed to justify spending thousands of dollars on, <laughs> so... Barone wanted to do two things. Learn how to code in C-sharp and create an homage to Harvest Moon while addressing his issues with the series. Chatting to GameDeveloper.com in March 2016, Barone explained, The gameplay in Harvest Moon was usually fun, but I felt like no title in the series ever brought it all together in a mm. perfect way. Mm. My idea with Stardew Valley was to address the problems I had with mm -hmm. Harvest Moon, as well as create more purpose, with tried and true gameplay elements such as crafting and quests. Ooh. After putting himself under self-imposed crunch for four long years, while also working part-time as a cinema usher, Barone My finally goodness. released the game in February 2016. Lo and behold, it might might make Angie Tori in a vengeful story. Did you eat a bunny? They somehow keep improving a game about farming. I mean, it's good they're improving it. That's always a good sign. Harvest Moon is pretty good, but I do miss the old ones where your character can end up in the hospital from staying awake for too long. Lol. It was a bigger and faster hit than a Williams sister tennis serve. Stardew Valley's cute art style and engaging, endless gameplay made it an endearing and highly accessible title. It sold 400,000 copies in its first two weeks, and two months post-launch, sales have already this topped a million was copies. Quite quick and that I success kept potato. growing, just like all my radishes. By 2020, it reached 10 million How copies, dare and you. in February 2024, eight years after launch, Barone shared that over 30 million copies of Stardew Valley have been sold across multiple platforms. I think he's probably paid off his computer science degree by now. Kind of, yeah. By comparison, yeah. Harvest Moon... I saw going... actually, <clears throat> not long ago, I think I saw the uh, post on Twitter where someone said that creator of Stradivali finally has a proper desk and they showed the new setup where, you know, he has a desk, he has the two uh, displays and all of that stuff. And then they show the comparison of the old desk when he has a desk with some additional little uh, wooden planks on it to have more space to put cup on it. And then the, 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 the displays are standing on like books and stuff stuck up. So the disc was so small, he could not fit on it physically with his creations. This was absolutely hilarious to see. Hi, Matt Fish, how are you doing today? Happy to see you, welcome. So it's funny to see that this guy, his game sold so well and is still selling. But he was still living with that poor little desk that he could barely fit on. 
by the title Story of Seasons since 2014 because of, you guessed it, stupid rights issues, has not reached anywhere near those numbers. There have been multiple Story of Seasons games and they have been successes. For instance, 2021's Pioneers of Olive Town did reach 1 million mm -hmm. Switch sales nine months after launch, but none of them have quite hit the astronomical success of the game developed by one dude who got sick of waiting for a title that <laughs> actually ticked all his boxes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I Why have like a bunch of strawberries to pick and about five villagers to flirt with. <gasps> Paradox! Oh yeah, I know that story. The first City Skylands is a great game. I love it. Games are created in an old garage trend, kind of, yeah. For decades, there was only really one game series that could provide the experience of building a huge city before immediately giving up because the traffic got too bad to manage. <laughs> created by <laughs> Maxis never and published by EA, SimCity became a huge hit, spawning three sequels and multiple spin-offs, most notably Swimming Pool Murder Simulator The Sims. Oh, no! But as the series stagnated, another developer rose up to try and take its crown, as pointed out by many of you, including Mia Pickle, who said, You mentioned EA so much, and yet you somehow didn't mention Cities Skylines. Yeah. Look, we couldn't list every game that embarrassed EA. We'd have been <laughs> here all day. While EA As focused on smaller SimCity spin-offs yeah. into the late noughties, Finnish developer Colossal Order and their publisher Paradox saw a gap opening up in the market. A studio of only five people, Colossal Order initially just focused on building a game around transport networks, hmm. releasing their first game in 2011, Cities in Motion. Not that my cities are ever in motion. I refer <laughs> I don't know you again you to my terrible traffic management. After its success, which spawned a sequel in... Ah yes, yeah, SimCity, a game where you can make a city look like a dystopia without tax. Yes. Cities in Motion, I know that one. I've never heard of that game. In 2012, Colossal Order were ready to finally step up into making a full-on city builder. And then, at the Game Developer Conference 2012, EA announced they would be rebooting SimCity. Oh yes. Which somewhat puts a spanner in the works, unless, I don't know, EA botched the release so badly that people couldn't play the game? Yes, fortunately for Colossal Order, EA made a colossal error. <laughs> for anti-piracy and multiplayer reasons, EA decided to require SimCity to be always online. But they... It was a bit too complicated for my taste a few years ago. I never played that. I'd trap people in the pool until they drown. I mean, I feel like nothing, uh, anything that EA touches instantly gets ruined. Not instantly, but it does get ruined at certain point. They have the touch, the the opposite of the Midas' touch, you know? Midas would touch everything and it would be golden. EA touches anything and at certain point you can be sure it's gonna be shit. Either immediately or after some time. They sure closed a lot of studios, that's true. That's called the EA Strand type Varius. <laughs> I think that's called the EA Touch. <laughs> He didn't provide it's enough called service for everyone to play on at release, creating a disastrous launch where hardly anyone could play the game Max has spent four years developing. <laughs> when people could get the game working, they were more restricted than in previous games in the series. For example, being given smaller lots to develop and not being able to name their <laughs> town something rude because yep. it was a multiplayer game That's with EA. a 10 plus age rating. R.I.P. Ass Town. Plus, there were issues with cloud saves that meant thousands of players lost hours of progress and sometimes even entire cities they'd built. They Yay. were pissed and EA even nice had to EA. issue a public apology. Smelling blood in the water, Colossal Order saw their chance and went for it, finally creating the game they'd always wanted to, City Skylines. Yay. City Skylines became an immediate success when it was released on the 10th of March 2015. Those left disappointed by the SimCity reboot had a refreshing, simple and, most importantly, playable replacement yeah. that didn't require them to be online. The demand was clearly there and City Skylines sold a staggering 1 million copies That's in its the first perfect month. Way to but it wasn't just a short-term sales hit. It continued to sell well and seven years later in 2022, it was reported that 12 million copies mm -hmm. had been sold, mm -hmm. with 6 million of those sales being in the final three years of that time frame, proving its continued popularity. Perfect. It's already nine years old. I'm surprised too, to be honest. It's sad that it is now hard to tell if Blizzard or EA was involved in the game. That's true. 
It even got a sequel, which, while not as well built or well received as its predecessor, still didn't f up its release quite as badly as SimCity 2013. That's true. And the, how is the Sims? The release of uh, City Skylines 2 was not the best, but it was far away from the SimCity release that EA did. City series doing? I want to say not great. Not great. I don't it think seems it's coming that Sim back. SimCity couldn't recover after that disastrous launch, with no new games being released after a lackluster mobile entry in 2014. Of course, there's then, always on the a mobile of entry. March 2015, just a week before City Skylines was released, EA shut down Maxis Emeryville, the makers of SimCity. Yeah. Since then, many. The saddest part is that Maxi was also the creators of. Oh, perfect outbreak. Uh, the creator of Sims, and since. EA completely took over, it just doesn't work. Only one million we're watching, wait, what? We're watching some Swedish guys in a boom closet sell 12 million practically overnight with Helldivers 2, and welcome to the indie developers. Yeah, SimCity, uh, after the launch that flopped completely, it never recovered. And I don't think Sims series will also recover after Sims 4 because Sims players at this point, as far as I know, um, they started to really not care for the franchise due to the fact how badly they're working on Sims 4. Like Sims 4 is not a good game. And the fact that The Sims 5, they immediately announced that it's gonna be online and, and mobile. Everyone was like, mm, I don't think I wanna touch that. Shame, Spore was a glorious uh, Darwinian mark, uh, maker that had much potential for truly unique species. That's true. I remember Spore. Most of people know. A lot of people love Spore. I never played Spore. But Spore is still freaking going strong. Like a lot of people still play that game and make videos of this game and all the freaking uh, stupid things that you can do there. You need to play Spore. I don't know if I would create a, a creature that would survive more than a few years. <laughs> I have no idea what my creation would be. I know that bunnies in this world are not the best. Spore is called classic. I mean, I know, I know. Just be better. The Darwin uh, don't evolve at all and beat the game. I don't think that would work with me, crab. I know that a Spore, no matter how old this game is, it's still going strong and popular. It does? Oh my god. I remember I made Mr. Potato Head in Spore one time. It can, it's literally an achievement. Oh my god. Carnivore bunny to rule them all? Hmm. I prefer a sweet fueled bunny. Many who worked on the game lay the death of the SimCity series squarely at EA's door. Speaking to PC Gamer, SimCity 2013's creative director Ocean Quigley shared that he was actually grateful that City Skylines exists, saying, I was thrilled to see City Skylines uh -huh. pick up the mantle, because EA pretty much said, we're done with this for now. Damn. You know what? I think we're done with this for now should be EA's new company motto. <laughs> That is so true! I played Spore the other day and made a creature that looks like Jar Jar Blinks in... It is great, oh no. It's going to be like the uh, that scene in the Holy Grail, the cave with thousands of bones around it, with only a bunny in cave, oh no. Hmm? Oh, that's cute! I want to know Not everyone where wants this to build a city. From. Some people want to build roller coasters that kill people. Yeah. Or zoos where animals can get out and kill people. Yeah. What? They do. For years, yeah. those weirdos who may or may not include me, were well catered for with the Tycoon games. Then two new successors had to step up to the plate, as pointed out by commenters such as Jenny Noel 6782 who said, Roller Coaster Tycoon slash Zoo Tycoon and Planet Coaster slash Planet Zoo. Both were massively popular in the 90s and 2000s. Both were then mishandled by their publishers or shelved by them. And True. both <laughs> then got made into massively popular spiritual sequel games by Frontier. Nothing but facts there from Jenny. 
Frontier Developments did work on Roller Coaster Tycoon 3 way back in 2004, but since then the series was taken back out of their hands while publisher Atari completely fumbled the series. No! Lowlights include 2014's Roller Coaster Tycoon 4, a terrible, janky, microtransaction filled mobile game, and 2018's <laughs> on rails PSVR shooter Roller Coaster Tycoon Joyride, which the sixth axis, one of the very few sites that bothered to review the game gave a 1 out of 10. Oof. Something we're unsurprised by, going by this nausea-inducing footage. Now imagine that, but you're wearing the headset. Ugh. Unable to save the series they'd once worked on, Frontier instead poured all their efforts into Planet Coaster. Released on PC on 17th of November 2016, this it was cool. well received by fans and critics, with Eurogamer naming it the finest park construction simulator yet. And it was a financial success too, selling yeah, over a million it copies looks great. in nine months. I love it. But as Jenny pointed out, not content with embarrassing one Tycoon series, Frontier took on another one directly afterwards, Zoo Tycoon. Like when Atari brought them in for Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, Frontier were brought in by Zoo Tycoon IP owners Microsoft to make a third entry in the series, specifically a 2013 reboot that would be a launch game for the Xbox One. But the Xbox One launch was lacklustre, and the reboot got very middling reviews, mostly because many reviewers lambasted the menus of the console-focused reboot, describing them as poorly laid out and cumbersome. Even its remaster in 2017 was only marginally better received, which is likely why Microsoft hasn't touched the series since. So it might be mildly mm, embarrassing mm, for Microsoft mm, that Frontier mm. got sick of waiting for another tycoon. Zoo Tycoon was a great series. I loved releasing, uh, releasing lions all over the park. Why am I not surprised, Hunter, that, that that's what you were doing? Starting to notice common theme here. Right in, who the thought? On Planet Zoo, Josh, let's game it out. PTSD, oh yeah. Let's game it out. PTSD is here. Oh, Pro Frontier, they made and uh, then ruined Elite Dangerous. Ah. Oh. Games had come along and made their own one, which was better, and made them, not Microsoft, loads of money. Without the shackles of the Xbox One control Look system, Frontier beauty. released Planet Zoo on PC in 2019. Look at people it. loved it, with the game passing the magical million so copy pretty. mark in just six months, cementing the Planet series as the new tycoon of sim game. Personally, I enjoyed watching uh, Let's Game It Out make the an hours long pathway just to get into the park. I just enjoyed his the fact that with the Planet Zoo, he made a whole fucking storyline on the moon. It was great. Okay, that's cool, but what about a zoo with dinosaurs? What, Frontier made two of those already? Yeah. What am I doing sitting here filming? Can we move this along a bit, please? Oh, I don't know this one. Never heard of that game. For many of these spiritual sequels, the inspirations are obvious, but some... No idea, nothing I do would make anyone think I enjoy watching in-game characters suffer. Of course not. ...are even more obvious than others. The next entry stood out to many of you, including Lauren Horn 1240 who asked, What about Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, the spiritual successor to Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future? They mm -hmm. even got the great Hideki Naganuma to compose music for the game like he did the Jet Set Radio series. 2000 Dreamcast game Jet Set Radio from Sega Studio Smilebit was a oh, game full of brightly coloured cell shaded characters who would skate their way around town, grinding on rails, spraying graffiti tags, and inspiring sunglasses envy in everyone who played it. Released in 2023 by indie studio Team Reptile, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk was a game full of brightly coloured cell shaded characters who would skate their way around uh -huh. town, grinding uh -huh. on rails, uh -huh. spraying graffiti tags, and. hang on. As you can imagine, when Bomb Rush Cyberfunk was revealed to the world, Jet Set Radio fans couldn't help seeing similarities between the two, mm. right down mm. to the number of syllables in the two titles. And it was totally understandable for Jet Set Radio fans to be excited. Sequel Jet Set Radio Future yeah! was released on the original Xbox in 2002, Jet Grind Radio appeared on the Game Boy Advance in 2003, Cute. and a high-definition remaster of the first game came out in 2012. But after that, there was a serious lack of cel-shaded rollerblading going on. <laughs> Most likely because Smilebit had been merged into another part of Sega, Jet Set Radio had ah. criminally been left languishing in Sega's bin of abandoned IPs alongside forgotten franchises like Clockwork Knight and Seaman. There are a lot of really amazing things about the internet, but as with everything else, it's not completely perfect. No one deserves to be stuck in a bit. Oh boy.
that looks like something that should not be a, a, a thing. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> that does not seem like a game that uh, should have seen the light of place even when never. In with C, man. Ugh. Team Reptile I clearly agree. got bored of waiting as well, and Bomb Rush Cyberfunk is a great game to pick up the mantle. No, Kat, not only not because it brought game. back Hideki Naganuma to make music for it, but also because it expanded upon the original games. For example, adding skateboards and bikes for you to ride around on, as well as the classic nice. inline skates. But it seems Sega paid attention to this success, uh -huh. as at the 2023 Game Awards, mm -hmm. a new Jet Set Radio was briefly teased that in Sega's trailer of upcoming games. <laughs> well, well, looks like someone's been down in the basement checking on I the IP. I can't wait for the Seaman stream. Someone Never. Check on them. I don't trust that Seaman. When you think you're winning, think again, because that's when the Reapers come, and that right there is where you learn to drive. Uh huh. And if you do. You might just get to see another sunrise. Nice! What's this game? Driving cars is fun, sure, but what's more fun is smashing cars with other cars. One I told you, Tori, to play this, this, this smashing car thingy. Tame. Yes, I know that you wanted to, uh, for me to stream it, but I didn't know how to make it fun stream. Who made the flat out I do, series. Do you like this demolition semen? derby racing series was adored by its fans, but Bugbear did not own the rights to the name. Oh, and after no. two games and two ports, the series was taken out of their hands and given to another developer. Gosh darn How it. Did that go? Not well. As, as noted always. by commenter Alex Joke9141, who wrote it never goes well. is another good example. When the rights to the flat out series was sold to another publisher, they fired the original dev team and proceeded to release the worst rated game on Steam. Damn. The OG devs then released a tech demo, Next Car Game, which was later developed into Wreckfest. The ironically go. named publisher Strategy First handed the reins to Team Six Game Studios and, out of Bugbear's creative control, flat out flatlined. On the 13th of December 2011, Flat Out 3 Chaos and Destruction was released to, quite possibly, some of the worst reviews Oops. in gaming history, earning a Oops. Guinness World Record for being the worst rated game on Steam with over 500 reviews. Oops. Determined to show how it's done and prove that people do still like car smashing games, as long as they're, you know, good, Bugbear Entertainment decided to take things into their own car smashing hands. Uh -huh. It wasn't easy for Bugbear. In November 2013, they launched and then quickly had to cancel their Kickstarter for the oh game no. after only reaching 81,772 of their $350,000 goal within 22 days. But undeterred, Bugbear just switched their funding approach to pre-orders to help get their passion project off the ground. And it paid off, literally. When a pre-alpha version of the imaginatively titled Next Car Game was released on Steam Early Access just a couple of months later in January 2014, the game made over $1 million nice. in its first Let's week, go. completely smashing their goals like a car they'd just driven into real fast. <laughs> it seemed that people just didn't realise that they'd wanted the game until they got to try it for themselves. Nah. Later, when the game exited okay. Early Access in June 2018, it got much better reviews than Flat Out 3, was nominated for multiple awards, and sold well enough for Bugbear to create multiple ports to consoles and mobile a couple of years later. So many Meanwhile, broken the Flat cars. Out series released Flat Out 4 Total Insanity in 2017, to very little fanfare and ambivalent reviews, before promptly being forgotten about. We think it's fair to say that Wreckfest wrecked Not Flat Out Not sure who got the good question at this point. That sounded a lot better in my head. The time has come, Underlord. Oh. Arise once more and prepare to begin. Hey, this your looks cool. War for the overworld. What that? You know how earlier we said we can't do every game that EA effed up? Well, God help us, we're still gonna try. Another series they all but forced developers to make their own version of was suggested by viewers such as Of Many Nicknames, who commented, Speaking of Bullfrog and EA, War for the Overworld, a counterpoint to that Dungeon Keeper mobile game. In the 90s, EA owned Bullfrog saw the dungeon crawling genre and thought, but what if you made the dungeon? And thus Dungeon Keeper was born, a strategy game released in 1997 <laughs> that had you waving around your hand of evil to build and run your very own evil labyrinth of doom. Hmm. 
folks loved it, Gabriel. and the game got a sequel in 1999. But after that, Bullfrog was shut down and absorbed into EA in of 2001. Course. So, much like Bullfrog's Theme Hospital, which we spoke about in our last video, the Dungeon Keeper series languished in EA's IP purgatory. So it was no surprise that when Subterranean Games, now known as Bright Rock Studios, shared their Kickstarter to make a dungeon management game in November 2012, they raised £211,371, nice. way above their requested £150,000 nice. goal by the time it finished. The game originally started off as a Dungeon Keeper fan game in 2009, but in 2011, the team shared in a Dungeon Keeper fan uh -huh. forum that they decided not to request the IP from EA, which would be near impossible, but to instead make it a completely new title. Very, that title very being good the idea. Subtitle Bullfrog planned to use for an abandoned Dungeon Keeper 3, War for the Overworld. Your minions are waiting, Underlord. <laughs> All that remains is for you to accept the call and join the battle in this war for the overworld. With Dungeon Keeper creator Peter Molyneux himself endorsing the Kickstarter this, and this a successfully is very cool. funded project, it seemed like nothing else could boost this game any further. Until he released a Dungeon yeah, Keeper game. One. But an incredibly f***y one. Oops. Announced in 2013, this Dungeon Keeper mobile game was perhaps spurred into existence by the success of the War for the Overworlds Kickstarter. Ew. But being a tower defense game filled with criminally grindy gameplay, this reboot was everything its fans didn't want. Yeah. Upon release in 2014, Eurogamer labeled it as Nations. a shell of Bullfrog's no one pioneering wants strategy a reboot game, this mobile game, hollowed out and filled up with what is essentially a beat-for-beat -beat clone of Clash of Clans. Ugh. Meanwhile, The Independent reported that many players labeled the game unplayable thanks to the design of the game being built around in-app purchases, meaning that it took a sarcastically long time to do anything. Of but course. rather than watch their imps take four hours to break down a single block of wall, or pay for the privilege to skip that time, people instead look for an alternative game and found War for the Overworld. Talking to Eurogamer two years later, head of Bright Rock Games, Josh Bishop, said that the attention it brought was quite a significant bump, akin no. to a Steam sale. <laughs> The fiasco of Dungeon Keeper probably earned Bright Rock some goodwill with fans nice. when War for the Overworld was delayed and put out on Steam Early Access in 2014. A rocky release in 2015 mm -hmm. with multiple patches did lose a lot of that goodwill, Oops. but by July 2016, the game had sold over 150,000 okay, copies. They fixed and as for 2014's Dungeon Keeper, EA shared on the official Dungeon Keeper forums that they would be ending support for the game on the 9th of August 2022 and removing moving it from stores, meaning that wow. current players couldn't buy new currency and no new players could download the game at all. So it was unplayable, as it always had been. There's always more to conquer. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video about spiritual sequels on Outside Extra, the spiritual and very much actual sequel to Outside Xbox, which is where I'm normally hanging out. Uh, if you'd like to see a video from Outside Extra, we've got one up here. And if you want to know what this Outside Xbox nonsense is all about, We've got a video down here from nice. us, and if you like what Hi, we do, and you'd Welcome. like to hang out with us Lovely in a private Discord, then do check out the OX Supporters Club at patreon.com slash oxclub. Hope to see you there. It's always cool to see people... Why do I have... Oh, okay. I, I was confused why do I have a cat girl on my screen, and now I see why. There we go. How are you all doing? I'm doing pretty good, although I'm drinking my tea, like, very fasty today. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just saw Hunter booting up Spore. <laughs> okay, <coughs> last video that I have prepared for today, let's go! I always love seeing developers looking at the big studio and their game and like, hey, you never, you never continued that one and we kind of liked it. What if we just did our own better version and they succeed? It's always nice. No, I'm not sure. Sure, Hunter. Master Chief, the hero of the Halo games. And he first appeared in the first Halo game, because Master Chief knows how to conduct himself. Huh? If only we could say the same for all of gaming's famous characters, but sadly, it's not the case. Because all too many of gaming's most recognizable and beloved characters actually made their debut way before the games they're famous for, in truly bizarre first appearances that will leave you saying things like, huh? And I guess Sonic is canonically an air freshener then? Weird. Huh. Well, uh, enjoy this video and beware spoilers for the following games. Worse than 
If you've heard of Conker, you'll most likely recognise him as the sweary squirrel who likes to get yeah. a bit squiffy. Yeah. I remember this game. I saw a whole game Charming. game gameplay. Conker's from bad this. birthday might have made him famous, or rather infamous, within gaming circles in 2001. But this was far from Conker's first most appearance in a video game. game. Instead, that honor goes to Diddy Kong Racing, the adorable 1996 kart racer full of cute, fuzzy, wuzzy animal characters like Timber the Tiger or Pipsy the Mouse, all friends of the titular Donkey Kong. And hey, wait a second, is that Banjo from 1997 game Banjo Kazooie? You better hope Kazooie doesn't find Damn. out about this Banjo, or else she's gonna be pissed. Indeed, this game Without by developer Rare had some real stars hidden in it, out. and some supporting characters from those titles too. Hey, Tippy, don't hurt yourself while driving because you've got a choir to conduct after this. Oh, the sound of his speaking. But between Diddy Kong Racing and Conker's Bad Fur Day's release, the Conker development team went to E3 and saw that nothing really separated their game from the dozens of other upcoming cute platforming titles that were on show. So they took the cute fluff ball first introduced in a children's kart racer and decided to retool Conker's kid-friendly adventure game into an adult one, full of innuendos and out your endos. Yeah. I am the great mighty poo and yeah. I'm going to throw my sh at you. Yeah, I yep. remember that this. Was a poo joke. Please like and subscribe. Conker did manage to get a family-friendly outing of his own just before this in 1999, with Conker's pocket tails for the Game Boy Color. But no one remembers that either, because this stuff sort of overwrites it in your brain. Don't let Rare anywhere near Timber the Tiger. You are to target the two nests occupying the Kitasaki Junction. The targets in question are a rank 27 reverse legged next called No Count and a four legged type, Identity Unknown. Fans of From Software's difficult action RPGs clearly like being punished. Because, I mean, just look at this. It's fine. But if that wasn't enough proof, consider that one of the most beloved characters in this series is Patches, a recurring cowardly ne'er-do-well trickster whose most famous trait is surrendering once his schemes are exposed. Schemes that usually involve kicking you off things like he's doing here in the 2020 remaster of 2009's Evil. Demon's Souls. <laughs> Take your time starving to death. Then I'll sell every last trinket off your corpse. <laughs> Incredibly, however, Demon Souls wasn't the first appearance of Patches. Instead, this creepy fan favorite actually debuted I in another you, From Software the series, Armored Core. <laughs> There's a character called Patch in the Master of Arena game for the PlayStation. I remember playing Conquer Bad Fur Day when I was eight. So much about me makes sense when I think about it now. Yeah, that explains a lot. That explains a lot, Hunter. But the character would be first properly fleshed out in 2008's Armored Core 4 Answer, where Patches appears as the pilot of a mech suit. Is, is this right? It is. For answer features Why? an enemy known as Patch the Good Luck, a wily mech pilot described as an independent mercenary who prefers to snipe from the air while his foes are off guard. Classic. Makes sense. You evil, evil boy. The origins of the famous Patches are on clear display here, as Patch the Good Luck does give up halfway Hi, through the fight against him. The links well, between this sci-fi fighter and his more medieval later appearances go even deeper, however. As well as some dialogue quirks in common, especially in the Japanese versions of the games, consider items Patches holds like the horse hoof ring, a symbol of his fondness for kicking, but also, it seems, a nod to his mech's distinctive reverse jointed legs. I see! Give him that in the Elden Ring DLC from software. Might spice things up a bit. <laughs> Don't underestimate the power of the Force. Bam. Bam. What are you doing? Bam. Bam. Battle Bam. one, fight! Bam. Bam. Star Wars The Force Unleashed introduced Galen Marek, aka Starkiller, an anti-hero strong with the Force. Except it didn't! Have you not been paying attention? Sure, The Force Unleashed may be Galen Marek's first adventure as the main protagonist, after you've spent 10 minutes being Darth Vader spinning Wookiees, that is. 
<laughs> that sounds about, about right. No! But this game wasn't the first time you got to play as him. In fact, his first appearance wasn't in any kind of Star Wars title. In July 2008, months Let's prior go. to the release of The Force Unleashed, Starkiller could be found as a playable fighter a in Soul Calibur 4, alongside Darth Vader on PS3 and Yoda on Xbox. This yeah. once-in-a-series crossover with Star Wars allowed you to have Starkiller, here referred to only as The Apprentice, face up against Soul Calibur's roster of big lizard men and people with regular metal weapons. Make, make sense. Sounds about right. Yeah. Are those things made of Beskar steel? Because otherwise you're sending them out there to be slaughtered, Soul Calibur. Starkiller even came complete with his own story mode, which, upon finishing it, rewarded you with a cutscene of Starkiller getting force choked by Darth Vader, before them both squaring up for a duel. Nah. A story for another day. Right, in other words, you'd better cough up 40 quid come September <laughs> if you want to find out what happens to these two. Yeah. What is this? Wait, what? Rat Good old Bobby. Sega. Can we all just take a minute to agree that Sonic the Hedgehog, for all his many qualities, would not smell good? One could <laughs> point to his all chili dog diet, no! or the fact that he's constantly running full pelt, or most damningly to the fact that he's worn the same pair of trainers for over 30 years without ever taking them off. So while I don't think we know oh, what no. Sonic's feet look like, and no, I will not be Googling to check. We do know that they probably smell pretty rough. You'd be surprised then to learn that Sonic appeared as an air freshener in the Sega arcade game Radmobile, what? swinging around from your rearview mirror in a vaguely physics-y way as you tear across the United States, what? presumably dispersing the sweet scent of chili dogs across your virtual dashboard. What? <laughs> Design comes from from an air refresher on the car. <laughs> How? I want to know who looked at this game, look at Sonic at the air refresher, and was like, "This, this is our new main character of the next game. This is the good idea that I can." <laughs> I want to see that conversation. Much more surprising, however, is that this is actually Sonic's first appearance in a video game ever. Radmobile came out almost a year before Sonic the Hedgehog made history on the Sega Genesis in 1990. I literally want to see that meeting when this one guy comes to his boss and he's like, Boss, I have the best idea that will bring us millions and millions and millions in, in sales. What is it? Let's take this air refresher from, from this car, from, from this from this racing game and make it into its own game. Let's go! And the boss, the funniest part is, said, yeah, that sounds good! What were they smoking? <laughs> oh, I want to see the logic of this. An air refreshener uh, in a fast car becomes a hedgehog that can go fast. <laughs> Oh my god! They did got millions and millions, that's true! And now the air freshener is the mascot of the company. The air freshener has an uh, appetite for chili dogs and we do cocaine. <laughs> My god, this is just... I just want to see the conversation and how this came up. 21. Considering the era it was so made, why was he was Sonic's probably debut so as a high he was To drum beating. up enthusiasm for his upcoming proper game, it seems. Although, how effective this bizarre cameo was at building hype for the character, I'm not sure. Seeing as how air freshener Sonic doesn't do or say anything. <laughs> what do you mean? It's swinging from side to side. I guess he is going fast? Technically? Uh, they were smoking the same stuff they did when every 3D Sony game sucked. No, I think they were smoking the same stuff when they made Mario. Luigi! Many nerds like to tout their video game knowledge with this interesting fact. Did you know that Mario's first appearance was in a Donkey Kong game? Hmm. 
created by Shigeru Miyamoto after he couldn't get the rights to Popeye, this mustachioed hero was originally called Jumpman. And rather than climbing down pipes and jumping on Goombas, Jumpman spent a lot of time climbing up ladders and jumping over barrels thrown at him by a big gorilla. Why did he they make a separate a game Nintendo of this? Nintendo I don't him get in his it own either. Arcade game with his newly invented brother, and thus Luigi made his first ever public appearance in a video game. Or so you might think, but you'd be wrong. And in this, the 40th year of Luigi. Wait, what? Shame. On the 14th of March 1983, approximately three months before their arrival on arcade machines, Damn the Mario Bros. <laughs> arrived on the Game & Watch. Yeah, that's right, Luigi made his debut on the Game & Watch Listen, game worked. titled Mario Bros., a handheld title that's been all but forgotten today. Which is why you probably didn't know about it, but we did, because we're Luigi experts. Luigi, oh no! Louis no! My lady grandfather owned a small arcade game that is the Mario vs. Donkey Kong when he was young. Damn. Luigi, that's what I said, Luigi. Luigi. I'm moving on. <laughs> In this game, each Mario brother featured on one side of the Game & Watch, and there were some Luigi. key differences compared to the brothers' later arcade appearances. First of all, their design in-game was less Mario Brothers and more Mr. Game & Watch, but there's two of them and they're wearing hats. Luigi wasn't even in green. Also, instead of being plumbers, these two worked in a bottling plant, and you controlled both brothers at the same time, zigzagging boxes of bottles up a bunch of conveyor belts and onto a truck. It's a cute piece of history, but not exactly the prime platforming gameplay we're used to and that they're famous for today. Well, Mario Lewis. is famous for platforming. Luigi's oh famous God. for killing bunnies with ruthless efficiency. Go on. Go on. Yes. 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 That's what you get, Luigi. That's what you get for popping out of cover. It's and Luigi a man. sniping. Luigi. Sniping oh, from the sky. Oh my god. So many confirmed kills for the L man. Totally unrelated to that, here's another video. I don't know what that card's going to point to. Could be anything. So you killed the chief, you bastard. Oh? Liquid? It's okay, those are rabbits. No, you're not. Don't move! Is this the first time you ever pointed a gun at a person? Your hands are shaking. <sighs> Can you shoot me, rookie? Metal Gear is a series full of iconic and memorable characters, some of whom don't even turn out to be clones of each other. One character in particular who makes a strong impression is Meryl Silverberg, who many millions of PlayStation owners will remember as the highly trained soldier whom Solid Snake fights alongside in 1998's Metal Gear Solid. Seeing other people die makes you feel alive, huh? You love war and don't want it to stop? Is it the same that is not Solid Snake. history? As you Meryl is introduced here and then goes on to feature in the Metal Gear games on subsequent occasions, you'd be forgiven for thinking this blocky depiction was her official video game debut. If we can't find them, we'll have no choice but to destroy Metal Gear. But only if you haven't played Hideo Kojima's Police Noughts. Wait, which, what? to be fair, you might not have, seeing as it was first released in 1994 Wait, on Japanese what? home computers and has never been published in the West outside of a fan translation. Why in this game, though? The game is about a detective investigating the murder of his ex-wife, but more importantly, and more surprisingly, Meryl is there. <laughs> Police Nort's Meryl is a futuristic so knife-wielding right cop now. who looks almost identical to her Metal Gear counterpart, and is introduced with a background that will instantly ring bells for those up on their Metal Gear lore, such as a history with Foxhound and a role in the fall of Zanzibar Land. She even shares a Japanese voice actor with Metal Gear Meryl of and has a fake is. Foxhound tattoo in both games. It's a paint tattoo. It's not real. The story here is that Hideo Kojima liked the character of Meryl so much, he lifted her wholesale from Police Noughts and put her in Metal Gear. Which no. means this early appearance, while basically identical, isn't really canon, seeing as Police Noughts is set in the year 2040 the and Metal Snake. Gear Solid I takes place in 2005. 
Still, there's no harm in imagining perhaps Merrill ends up as a hard-boiled sci-fi detective many years in the future, right? Who knows, it might be preferable to the end of her Metal Gear storyline, which is, let's see... Married to Johnny, the comedy soldier who has diarrhoea the whole time. <laughs> Finally. Johnny. Head cannon it is, then. Oh, no! No! <laughs> Super Smash Brothers is a series with a simple but great premise. Yeah. Get a bunch of beloved Nintendo characters and have them punch the living daylights out of each Fire other. Like, also, someone wrong with from that. Fire Emblem is there. Okay, we kid, we kid. Despite the series not being released outside of Japan, Fire Emblem staple Marth joined Super Smash Bros. Melee thanks to a huge number of fans demanding to know why their blue-haired Nintendo fave was snubbed from the original <laughs> roster. And, like some kind of sweet cherry on top, he was joined by another favourite of the series, Roy. Roy! Roy! Except Roy wasn't the series' favourite. And no, this isn't about some heated argument within the fandom, Roy wasn't even in Fire Emblem yet. Roy didn't actually make his Fire Emblem debut no. until Fire Emblem Binding Blade, which came out in Japan on the 29th of March 2002, four months after Super Smash Bros. Melee was released on the 21st of November 2001. <laughs> So while many Smash Brothers players outside of Japan assumed, and may still assume, that Roy was added to the series because he was already a big deal in Japan, in actual fact, his first outing was being shoved in Melee as a way to market the no. new Fire Emblem. I actually do own Smash Bros, and I wanted to make a stream with Smash Bros, but because the Nintendo servers are completely broken, I was unable to play with people who tried to join me in the game. So unfortunately, that ended up as a complete fail game. <laughs> Nobody tell the Waluigi fans, or they'll be real mad. What? Are you kidding me? Oh no. Oh, God, God. I, I want to see what, what happened with Waluigi, how Waluigi became a thing. <laughs> So those were some of the famous video game characters that didn't make their first appearance in their own games, but in some other random game. And now, hey, they're, they're, they've got their own series. They're in their own thing. That's cool, right? Can you think of any? Let us know in the comments down below. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, do not forget to like, no, comment, good. subscribe, I all I that jazz. About We've also got that. a Patreon where you can become an OX Club supporter um, and link will be on screen. And if you want some more fantastic videos to watch, we've got some right here. But in the meantime, we shall see you next Bro. time. Have a lovely If day. Waluigi isn't in the next game, oh no. <clears throat> oh, you mean he never got into Smash Bro? Oh no. Or you needed a partner for Mario Tennis? Oh, that's a funny thing to, to happen. Why Luigi? You're gonna be a character because tennis needs... There is a partner for you. <laughs> Mario got it? No! Waluigi is a, uh, is in Smash as an assist trophy, but not as a character. Oh, this is so awful.